So, uh, hi everybody. I'm uh, Mog. Oh, hi. Hi, Mog. Oh, hi, Mog. A um, couple big surprise announcements that I didn't realize. Uh, first off, I forgot today's uh, Software Freedom Day. Gay freedom. Freedom? Free software? Freedom. Thumbs up. <laughs> also, it's Nathan's birthday. If everybody could just wish Nathan a happy birthday. And give him drinks. He needs them. So, uh, unrelated to that, uh, who here knows what BitMessage is? Anybody? Okay. A few people, most of the people that are around me all the time. That's kind of surprising. Um, BitMessage is a secure peer-to-peer -peer email replacement. And first off, what's wrong with email? Anybody, anybody have any ideas they want to share? There's no drinking involved! <laughs> I thought all email you had to drink. Occasionally the NSA can't read it. The NSA can't read it? Occasionally. But but they can. They can they can always get the metadata these days. Uh ninety nine percent of email, all the you know, it's in the clear postcard. That's a problem. Uh the other thing is, you know, I think I read somewhere once it was like eighty percent of all email is at Gmail now. Like either being sent to Gmail or sent from Gmail. So, I trust the Google. So you, you're, yeah, you're trusting uh, those guys with a lot, and so that's you know they're pretty big target for those lovely NSA warrants to just get everything. Warrants? I'm sure. Warrants. When did they start using those? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, the other problem is spoofing. Um, who here has gotten a president from um, a president? Who here has gotten an email from the president or anybody else fictitious? It's yeah, it's it's real easy to you know fake emails, given that no clients check or, or show you the headers to show that no, it didn't really come from the president. It came from Nigeria. You sent email from God. What did God have to say? I need a money. I need a I'm not real. That's what he said. I need a blowjob. <laughs> he needs a blowjob and he's not real. Interesting. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, there's this thing called spam. Who here, who here knows about spam? Uh, I hear it's an amplifier. It's an amplifier? It's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious and nutritious. Google makes it go away. And, and Google makes it go away. Uh, the other really big problem with email, uh, who here has tried to set up their own email server? Oh, yeah. And, and who here has succeeded? Yeah, pretty much the same? <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Most, most people could not set up their own email. It's a pain in the ass. Uh, anybody here who's set up their own email, I'm sure, has had problems with you know, getting your email read by certain places being marked immediately as spam because you're not <laughs> Gmail or someone else. It, it's no longer uh, an open playing field. It's poor. So uh, what are your options? You know, if you don't want to get spied on or you want your stuff to work? Post-it notes. Post-it notes? <laughs> that didn't make my list. <laughs> but you were close. <laughs> so you got instant messaging. Um, a lot of people, you know, don't send... <laughs> send emails anymore, they just IM each other and, and whatnot and text messaging and all that stuff. Uh, most of the problems with instant messaging are the same problems with email though. Yeah, they're and they're not secure. The, yeah. yeah, exactly. But they're not secure, they're unencrypted, the government is reading everything. Hmm? They, yeah, exactly. Your copies of your truck, uh, conversations are everywhere for people to read. So instant messaging is probably not the best solution. Uh, they're email-like services like uh, Facebook and Reddit, G+, and other things that basically have just reinvented email, um, but they are very much the same problems. You know, everything you have is on G+, and you're trusting them, or you're trusting Twitter to, you know, keep this stuff secure or private in any way, and so it's not not the best option. Um, you have VoIP, uh, which uh, is 99% of the time unencrypted everywhere. Uh, and is tracked uh, through services like Kalia. If you ever touch the PSDN, you're going to be tracked. Uh, your calls are going to be tracked. 
Um, so, boy, uh, also, who here likes to talk on the phones? That guy. Get out. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> Drink. So semaphore was my ridiculous answer. I think that's pretty safe. What? For now. It's, it's, For now. It's, an open, it's open. It's open, but who knows how to read it? <laughs> I was going to say Morse code. We'll write an app for that. Yeah. We'll write an app for that. Okay, so maybe semaphore is fucked too. But <laughs> shit. Okay. That's them before efficient audios. Um, so, Bit Message. Bit Message is, uh, was started uh, several months ago, um, right before all this NSA stuff actually happened. Uh, uh, the main developer of it was kind of obsessed with Bitcoin and wanted to make a messaging service that uh, kind of mirrored some of its uh, aspects. And so, here is why it is awesome. Um, it's all peer to peer. Uh, currently, there is a, uh, a seed node that is handing out you know, where all the peers are. And so that's a point of failure. Um, but, the, but that's not a feature of the protocol, that's just a feature of the, the single client implementation right now. It would be trivial to, uh, just like how BitTorrent works, uh, to have a different, uh, to put in a different seed node to start connecting to the other nodes. Um, so it's fairly peer-to-peer -peer beyond that. Once you're bootstrapped, you're, you're totally disconnected. Uh, it encrypts the entire message. So your to, your from, your subject, the body, it is all uh, one encrypted envelope. So there's no information leaked. There's no way um, if someone obtaining the bit message packet to know who you were talking to, who they were trying to talk to, and, and what was being said. Uh, the only idea they would have is, is the approximate size of the message. Um, but beyond that, there, there's no way of knowing what the message was. Random panic, that's what we need. Um, the, it uses a proof of work scheme to limit spam. Uh, much like how Bitcoin does its blocks, uh, every bit message is signed with a, uh, a double SHA-512 um, block that authorizes the message to be on the network. So for a spammer to, to inject uh, garbage into your system, it's very expensive compared to currently where a botnet for, for bit message would be very expensive versus a botnet for email. And so that's uh, awesome. Uh, it has, uh, currently there are SMTP and POP uh, providers that will send messages into the BitMessage network and then out the BitMessage network. So you can still use uh, your favorite emailer like uh, Evolution or uh, Emacs, um, <laughs> whatever you use for email. Outlook, um, Outlook uh, that would be possible. But given that it's software free today, no, we're not going to talk about Outlook. <laughs> uh, we call it Lookout, you know. Hey, I got a message from Nathan <laughs> while you were in the room. I said it 10 minutes ago. No, 12 minutes ago. And Happy I birthday. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, one feature of the protocol that's actually pretty neat is uh, the uh, ability to have mailing lists built into the uh, system. So you can subscribe to a mailing list just by knowing it's the mailing list ID and then you receive all the mail that was sent to that mailing list ID. So uh, uh, forums, things like Twitter and stuff could be implemented on top of BitMessage pretty trivially because of that. Um, it works over Tor, it's all TCP. So if you wanna be even more anonymous, you can set it up so your BitMessage client never touches the real internet directly. And you will never, never be close to being de-anonymized. Uh, it's free software, it's awesome. It's MIT licensed. Do whatever you want with it. Even make it not free software. That's how you get down. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you all about how the, the protocol actually works. Um, so there are five, yeah, five major messages. Um, each, uh, each email address in, Bit, uh, in BitMessage is, the, is a hash of the public key. So my BitMessage ID is bm-garbage. And uh, so when you are joining the network for the first time, you transmit your public key into the, to the node so other people can find you and, and send you a message. So the first type of message is a, is a publishing of your public key, and then you send that to the peers that you're immediately connected to, and they can, can read it, and then they send it along, and everyone else kind of absorbs your public key into the network. Um, 
which is, is beneficial because that way, then that first time somebody wants to send a message to you, when they finally do it, you aren't saying, oh, I'm me, here's my, you know, my, my GPG key. There's no action you take for them to find you on the network and, and send you a message. And so, you know, the opposite of a public key, so a get public key request. So let's say somehow I find out uh, Nathan's bit message address because he uh, wanted me to send him a message. So I say, give me his public key and I can pull it down from the network. And after I have his public key, I can send him a message. So a message is uh, you take the, the recipient's public key and you encrypt your message uh, your subject, your body, um, you encrypt that, and then you run this proof of work scheme. On my laptop, it takes about four minutes for it to compute the proof of work. Uh, I have a kind of slow laptop, but uh, it does take time to send a message. Um, and then you would send the message out to all the peers, and the message is just an encrypted blob uh, that no one can do anything with, but they keep passing it along the network. Um, and then the opposite side, which is kind of optional, it, it is optional, but uh, it's very beneficial in the network. And so I send off my blob into the, into the cloud, and it's just being routed around and around. And eventually it will hit Nathan's computer. Um, and he, by default right now, he will act the message back. So then that my client knows, uh, I'll eventually get the act back, but my client will know he received the message, I don't have to resend the message. Because otherwise, I have no idea if I need to keep resending the message because I don't know if he ever got it. And so, and then there's uh, the fifth type of message is a broadcast message, and this is the the how the subscriptions uh, the mailing list support works. So the mailing list you uh, you have the public key of the mailing list. So the, the mailing list is uh, let's say uh, there's a one if you're interested in torrents, for example. There's a, a group that publishes torrents through BitMessage. And so they advertise, we're torrents, and then this is our ID. You take that ID, and let's say you have this new juicy torrent you want to publish into the network about uh, the new version of Gentoo. It needs to get out there. And so you will take the, you know, the magnet link or whatever for the new version of Gentoo, and you will send it to this public address, and then it knows that that's going to be a broadcast message to this list, and so instead of encrypting it with the private key of the mailing list, it encrypts it with the public key of it. And so anyone that knows the public key's ID can reverse it and, and unencrypt that message, and everybody can get to it. And that's uh, how that works. And the, the, the only real difference between a broadcast and a message is you know uh, there's never going to be an act on the broadcast, because you will receive the broadcast yourself. Uh, Bob? What's the round trip for the message and message hack? Um, so, it, the, the, a message, like I was saying before, uh, you have to do this proof of work. So I did the proof of work, or Nathan did the proof of work on whatever he had, and it took uh, 12 minutes for him to get the message to me. So that was some of his proof of work time, and then some of it was him sending his message to his eight nodes that he was connected to, and them sending it to their eight nodes and eight nodes outward and then I eventually mine got it. It looked at the encrypted blog, saw that it was for me, decrypted it, and then it sends the act back out through the network to Nathan. And so worst case I would say like given how long it took here it was, was thirty minutes between message sent to message to act received. Um, so uh, so that's kind of um, that's the, the major parts of the protocol and then this is how the network is set up. Um, so like I was saying before, you have this bootstrap server that shows you where all of your peers you're going to connect to are, and uh, that's pretty much all it does. Um, so you get, you get the peers from the bootstrap server, and then you, um, the peers start sending you all the messages they have. Uh, every you know, blob that comes in, every encrypted blob, uh, it sends it to you. You mark it in a database you know, that you've seen this blob before. Um, and if you haven't, you send it along, it keeps going through the network. Uh, so yeah, you get the messages from the peers. You verify, um, before you even do that, uh, you verify the messages are valid to still be in the network. So Bit, BitMessage has, doesn't have an infinite blockchain like Bitcoin. Uh, there's certain rules for a message to be allowed on the network. So one, the message can't be from the future. 
So if the message is dated, it, dated a week in, in the future, it's an invalid message. You can throw it away. If the message is more than two days old, it, it's an invalid message. They have to resend it. You throw it away. Um, uh, if the proof of work for the message doesn't match the message, it's garbage. Throw it away. Um, so you have to do that work to, to see if the message is valid. But if all those things are valid, you're going to relay that message on to your other peers. So to keep the message flowing through the network. Um, and you do that even if the message is intended for you. You don't check at that point. Because if you did, it'd be kind of, it wouldn't be obvious, but it would be uh, capable to see, oh, he's not sending along the messages that are sent to him. Those messages are sent to him. Let's try to attack those. Um, so after you've done all this, you, you have your public key ring of your identities as well as the identities of the subscriptions that you, uh, the mailing lists you've subscribed to, and you just check them. You try to decrypt the blob. And if the decryption goes successfully, it's for you. You can read the message. And if it's not, it's garbage to you at this point. You throw it away. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much how that works. Um, so bit message is very new. It's 0 0.3.5 now. Um, so it has uh, a lot of issues like anything else. Uh, one of the big issues is the addresses are like Bitcoin addresses. They are garbage. People don't like to hand out garbage. Uh, so it's definitely not going to impress your mom or your dad. To give it could them be a good thing. It could be a good thing. <laughs> I like getting mail. I guess you've got mail. I've got mail, <laughs> actually. Um, the other thing is speed, like we were talking about. So this is a slower uh, service than email. Uh, even uh, just it's the way it is. It's not instant messaging replacement. Uh, Faster than snail mail? It's certainly, I mean, it was 30 minutes uh, between two endpoints back and forth just then. Uh, but it is also uh, very, uh, yes? What about an issue of scaling if this is all peer-to-peer, -peer, if you had four million users, it seems like it wouldn't scale very well. Right, that's actually one of the big problems that they are currently um, addressing. Uh, they, they have a plan to some degree of it already. So every bit message address is, is the public key as well as the, um, the, the, what's it called? the shard of it. Right. So it, the, the network has the ability to be sharded. So then you can say, only give me the shards I care about. But that's still actually uh, a problem because if you subscribe to um, other subscriptions that are in other shards, that night they'll still listen to that whole other shard. And then also, it is losing some anonym anonymity. So I'm right now in shard one because I'm you know an early adopter and everybody's still in shard one. But let's say five years from now they start sharding it and you get shard 13. It's obvious that you are a newer member of the network than I am. And so that's given up some of and then so they're still working on that the best way to split the network um, so that you aren't receiving every message on the network but the way it's currently implemented is every message on the network gets to every endpoint or has a, has a best effort to get to every endpoint um, how to what degree does it increase the raw message size when it encrypts it and stamps it and sends it uh, it, it doesn't increase it much at all uh, the way the messages are um, Encrypted, uh, what should we call it? They, they encrypt the same way GPG does. And so you have uh, a, a one time pad encryption over, over this blob. And then that, uh, the one time pad is encrypted uh, with an elliptic curve crypto algorithm. So the, 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 the pad is the only, only thing that's actually being uh, expanded in the encryption process. Everything else is, it stays about the same size. So the, the file size actually doesn't matter. But that actually is part of um, something that would affect the speed as well. Uh, the larger your message is, the more work it's going to take your computer to do the SHA-512, uh, double SHA-512 over the block to find uh, the proof of work. And so BitMessage currently allows for a max file size of 180 megabytes to be sent um, as a valid block uh, across the network. That's big enough. That would take on this laptop Three years to compute. The first four. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very so difficult. It's not fast did, they, did they also put a limit on how many how many messages can be done in a in a day? Because I was I was thinking that if somebody was wanting to avoid traffic analysis, they could be sending out 
messages on a constant basis, but have both of them be going, you know, just be garbage. Oh, uh, well, the way that that's kind of avoided, um, I didn't really talk about it too much, but whenever you, whenever you are doing an action that's going to cause a transmit of a message, the way it works right now is it applies a random delay of up to 10 seconds um, on sending it back out. And that's if you are operating as, there's three modes, the way, or two modes you can really be connected to the network. You can be acting as like a real peer-to-peer -peer server where you're allowing connections in and out. And then the other is more of a, like a client, so you're behind a firewall. And so you're only making connections to other peers uh, directly. They're not going back out. Um, but if you're in the, the full peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mode, you can have your messages, you can have them wait until you receive a, a block that you're going to be sending out, so you can send out the blocks together to make it look like that you weren't doing anything, it was just automatically happening. But the way that most messages go out of the network right now is there's just that random delay applied to it. And so as long as the, the network is healthy and lots of messages are flowing across it anyways, it, it's hard to see that it's your message. Um, and like I was saying before, you can push everything out over Tor. So all of it's blobbed, they, they can't tell what it is. Tor app? Uh, so, it, BitMessage itself just uses Tor as a proxy, like a lot of other apps. Um, there are uh, there are packages of Tor, um, various ways that can install. Um, I, um, uh, Debbie and I just app get installed Tor. Uh, I imagine on Windows there's a bundle or something you can install that will give you the proxy you like on your machine. Android. Oh, on Android there's Warbot. Uh, which is a Tor client that you can run on your phone and, and pipe traffic through Tor on your phone. Uh, I think it's Orbot, isn't it? Yeah, it's Orbot. Okay, yeah, it's Orbot. O R B O T, and it's in F Droid, which is the free software Android store. Everybody should use it. Lots of freedom there. Pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, that's that's the way you can avoid some pattern analysis, um, like we were talking about. Uh, the next thing is bandwidth. So like we were just talking about, all the messages from the network go through. Um, yesterday I spun it up uh, before I went to sleep and I processed uh, just about 10,000 messages. So it really wasn't that much, but we have real good internet in the States compared to like, I don't know. Uh, China. China. China has bad internet. I haven't heard anything about that. Canada. Canada best internet. But it would be bad for phones, for example. I, I pushed uh, probably a few hundred megs of traffic. So if you were on your, your phone running this, it would not, um, you might not be happy with that. Uh, the CPU time is intensive. So in sending a message, that's a lot of work. But then the other big workload that people forget about often is every single message that comes in, you have to see if it's for you. You have to try to decrypt it. That's expensive and it can add up um, like I was saying on my laptop, uh, when I first fire it up and start receiving all the bit messages, uh, it'll peg my CPU for a few minutes until it catches up, and then it's fine. But um, that, that's not as big an issue for like a static PC where you're just leaving it always running, because the messages coming through the network aren't, that, aren't so fast that uh, that's an actual issue. Um, it's not web-based. It, it never really will be web-based and be secure. Uh, so if you want the terms, right? If you want <laughs> Gmail, it's not Gmail. Um, it's not mobile. There, there's a build of it actually for Android right now, uh, but like I was saying before, it has all those problems that would be uh, problematic on Android. Um, if people want it mobile, uh, they should use. I think they should use the uh, email interface to it, right. where you set it up to just forward. Uh, you set up your own kind of server and forward mail through it back and forth. But obviously, that won't work. For everybody, you're not going to convince um, people to, to, to do that. It's, it's problematic. Um, the other big thing is, like I was saying before, this is a two day window. So, given that people, most people who use it even, aren't using it every day yet, uh, it's not part of their life. So, if I sent a message to Nathan and he doesn't sign on for the next two days because he's lazy and horrible <laughs> and a slob, um, it's his taking up all your CPU time that you can't process the message. Eventually the message will die and I will have to redo the proof of work and send the message out again and be even more annoyed that he never answers. 
Yes. Will so. you get confirmation that the message is dead? Like you say, he could receive it. You get you, you, you do. It's it's this thing. It's a clock. No, no. And as time progresses, it moves. <laughs> you don't get an off back. It's Clockwise it's too. Dead. <laughs> no, there's there's not a message sent over the network saying. Fuck you, we're dropping your message. It's, it's just dead. You just assume that it's dead at, at that point. Um, the other way you would know is, let's say Nathan is being ultra secure and he doesn't want to act messages back. I would know he got my message when he replies to it. Or I talk to him out of band. What if it was a non-reply message though? Right, I, I wouldn't know. How, how, how do you know when you leave post-it notes that they're act? Uh, I, I, I mean, that's a problem, but that's the same problem with email right now. If I email Nathan, he never responds. <laughs> that hurt. Uh, uh, PEPCAC, still a big problem. Uh, so there was recently, um, BitMessage, I think, is uh, rumored to have around uh, close to 100,000 people now. And a secure researcher thought it would be really funny. Uh, he sent out an HTML email. Uh, to one of the more popular mailing lists. Um, and I can't remember what exactly it said, but something enticing. And it had a link. Dream. And uh, <laughs> BitMessage will show links. It'll allow you to highlight them, but it won't allow you just to go click and open the web browser. Because they thought, you know, that's enough. <laughs> it's safe. But people would copy the link, go to the website, and he would use uh, information about, uh, he was watching the network to see when the first time people published their my public key and see what IP they had come from when they had published the public key for the first time. And he saw, oh, that public key, that IP, click the link that they just got. That's that guy. And he did that um, and de-anonymized a few thousand users. Uh, because they were not thinking. Uh, I, I don't think he published who these people were, but uh, it, this is still email. There are going to be things like scams. Um, uh, another thing, some people have a problem with it, it's written in Python. Um, it's part of the reasons why it was so slow earlier is uh, it was single threaded and all the CPU computations took place in one place. Um, now it's multi-threaded for doing the decryption and so it's not as big a problem. But uh, some people hate Python. And uh, it's written in Qt. Um, some people hate Qt. Doesn't look like anybody here does. I hate Qt. Uh, but because it's written in Python and Qt, it is multi-platform. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And uh, there are worse things. There are worse things? Like Fortran. Fortran. <laughs> that would be pretty bad. Uh, and this is, is something that goes on a lot on some of the mailing lists, uh, people talking about BitMessage, is there are people that are afraid that the crypto is going to be broken. And the reason f they're afraid of this, is like I've been saying, is all the messages on the network have the possibility of going to every node on the network. Right. So if you think that the NSA isn't on the network and storing every message till the end of time, I mean, that's kind of silly. They're doing that. And at some point, I, I think it's equally probable they will break the crypto, and that will happen. But the reason why I still think this is a very silly concern is the NSA at that point will have trillions and trillions of blobs. They're each encrypted to different people without any idea, any sign of who they're encrypted to. So to sift through it and say, okay, I'm going to find all of Nathan's messages because he's a horrible person. And they're going to go through. And so first, they're going to just find all of Nathan's outbound messages. Because those are the only ones that are, um, or not outbound, inbound messages. They'll find all of the messages that were sent to Nathan. Then, they will have to look at each single message that was sent to Nathan, see who it was sent from. And then they're going to have to go find that person's key. And go through all the messages. And find all those, those that correlate. So to co collapse all the information about Nathan... It would be ridiculously difficult. Um, even if you have, even if you can break the encryption very quickly, uh, going through the web of all the messages is ridiculous. And on top of that, if Nathan is, just for fun decides I want a new Bitcoin, a uh, new Bit message address, he hits a button and he has a new Bit message address. So that's a whole nother 
rabbit hole for them to ch chase down and try to discover his messages. So the actual compute time, even if breaking the crypto was trivial, it, it's, it's not worth doing. Uh, they're going to go break his hands and steal his laptop and hope for the best. But I, I don't know. Some people are concerned about that. Uh, I was reading... Uh, Uh, there, there are some people that are, uh, I think, a little ridiculous in that every message they send out, they create a new identity and, and, and do that, just like you can do with Bitcoin. Um, I think that makes it very difficult to continue conversations with people <laughs> <laughs> if their email address keeps changing. <laughs> but, but the other thing you can also do that, that they um, recommend as well is you can maintain as many identities as you want. So I have, a I have an identity that I only talk to Nathan with. Because I don't want any of our other conversations getting leaked out. Best policy. <laughs> I recommend you all do the same as well. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Keep one special just for me. Uh, that is possible. Uh, the I'll show in a, in a minute, but the message client, when you send a message, it's a drop down of people you want to send it as. Um, so you can you can pick and choose. Um, demo. So uh, let me unskip out of there. Yeah, what'd y'all think? <laughs> So uh, this is the, the main application. Um, it's really small. I didn't realize that. Uh, so when you, when you first sign in for the first time, it's going to pop you up to this tab. This is your identities tab. So I've created a few identities. I have uh, my Freaknik identity that I just created uh, the other night. I have my Mog Huntsville friends. And then I have my test identity. So um, the way you create these identities, you just hit this new tab, and this pops up. And you have actually two options. You can use random data to create your identity, which is the only option you should ever click. This other option, stupid. <laughs> this allows you to use a passphrase to make your address. So you can deterministically create your address. Um, the advantage of doing that, if you do this, is you have a password that you could go onto another computer and from scratch recreate your bit message identity. The downside of this is you have a password <laughs> that people can take <laughs> and recreate your bit message <laughs> identity. It, it, it is, uh, greatly reduces the randomness. You are not as random as a random number generator. Um, so yeah. <laughs> you guys don't have real random number generators? <laughs> Using pseudo random number generators? <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, and then you have the option of uh, here, this is what I was talking about before, you have the, the shards, so you can use the most available stream, which is what they call shards, um, or you can use a shard in a shards list you already have. So I could tie it to one of these so that I'm not getting as many messages in and I can reduce my bandwidth footprint. Um, this makes it work faster and is nicer. This makes you more anonymous. But right now it's kind of moot because there is only the one shard. And then it has this nice little thing where it'll do, uh, it'll keep creating bit message addresses until it finds one where uh, the address collision, uh, the hash of the address is slightly smaller. So like you'll notice here, this bit message address is shorter than the first one I generated. Uh, Tuttle? Uh, actually, they just started to uh, integrate uh, an API uh, here, so if you go to settings, they added support for Namecoin integration. People that like Namecoin, uh, it's a distributed DNS-ish thing, like Bitcoin, where you mine for names. I don't really understand how Namecoin works. I, I don't really like Namecoin, but the idea is you can create a Namecoin address that's mog at mog.com, and then you could tell people, hey, email me at mog at mog.com on bitmessage. And then bitmessage will do the query to see who is mog at mog.com. But the problem with that is if you don't have the name.com hash table on your machine, you're making a query out to uh, the, the namecoin db saying, hey, who's mog at mog.com? Which kind of 
defeats everything we've just been talking about. <laughs> You've identified everything. So I kind of don't like this feature that they've been adding, um, but some people really hate sending messages to BM dash blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you have these identities. Um, and then this is like here telling you what stream they're in. They're all in stream one. Um, and so then it looks a lot like a normal email client. You have inbox. Uh, so here are these messages from Nathan. We're going we're to see what you said. What are we doing for the bachelor party? That's old? Well, that's not good. A month ago? Are we live? That's true. Okay, so I will send a reply to Nathan. Um, so we will reply. Yeah. And I will send it from the Freak Nick identity, like we've been talking about. And then um, I can broadcast this to everybody who subscribed to my address book, but we really just want to send it to Nathan. Um, and that way you could add more addresses. So let's say I wanted to email somebody other than Nathan. I can lo load more addresses from my address book. But we're not going to do that. We're going to send, and then I'll show you here that the, the sending process is sent. So now it's doing the necessary work to send the message. So uh, this will take just a little bit, and I'll compute it and send it. Um, what else? Uh, so if you're sending out to multiple people who aren't on a mailing list, yes, you have to do each address. But like that option was saying, there's the option that, let's say I wanted to send a message to everyone in my address book who cares enough about me to subscribe to me. I can say send to everybody in my um, address book and it'll send to, uh, I mean send to everybody that subscribed to me, it'll send to everybody that subscribed to me. And that's what I was saying. So, um, oh, so see, I sent the message and now I'm waiting on acknowledgement. So the work was done. Nathan is going to get the message in a little bit. But here, I'll show you the inbox. So this is one of the, the public bit message mailing lists. Uh, apparently, e-cigarettes. Guys, should smoke. Everybody, don't drink. Smoke. Double down and do both, baby. Double down, do both? Okay. So yeah, sometimes there's weird stuff on the mailing list. But if I was re to reply to this mailing list, um, reply to this message, I'm not replying to the party that sent the message. I'm replying actually to the whole list. So everyone that had subscribed to this list will get this message. Um, and the way you manage your subscriptions is you will um, become aware of a, an ID out of band, just like in, in real mailing lists. You'll, you'll find out about a mailing list. They'll advertise their bit message address, and you'll just add new subscription. This will be blob, and then you paste in the bit message address, and then that subscribes to you. So uh, there are... There are some bit message forms. Uh, there's actually a very good one on, on Reddit. There's our bit message. And people there talk about uh, bit message development as well as some of the mailing lists that are there. Um, there are, the ones I subscribe to mostly are just about bit message. Uh, before I deleted some, uh, the first ones that were out there were all kind of like porn related. Um, people that were just testing, sending images through just for, you know, research, educational purposes. Uh, but they were sending images through BitMessage and playing with the base64 encoding um, and sending images. But I had subscribed to a bunch of them, you know, for research. And uh, but they're they're BitMessage now uh, mailing lists for everything. And actually, they added recently a new feature called Channels, which is the idea is much more like 4chan, is that you have a a channel that has a name and an address, and the name is like the password to get into this secret group and then the mess it, the idea is how you uh, uh, what you subscribe to but I haven't really played with that because that stuff seems highly skeezy um, so I'm still waiting for an acknowledgement are you not running it right now oh, okay well we'll get it get it soon not fall up um, one of the the things that will actually show you what's kind of going on is this uh, status here it shows you that you know I'm on stream one I'm connected to eight computers right now since I've turned the laptop on here, I've, s I've processed 687 person-to-person -person messages, um, the majority not being for me. I've gone through uh, 1,300 broadcast messages, and I've seen 230 public keys published. Uh, Bob? Uh, there have been people that have kind of played with that, 
but uh, no, not not really right now. Um, the it has the ability to be run as a, a daemon um, without the CLI, so uh, you could like cron that, like you run it at night and turn it on and off. Um, the other option too that uh, a lot of people are doing, like I was saying before, is they'll run it on their server, set up email forwarding from it, and then just email on the clients and whatnot. Uh, Tyler. Yes, they, and they picked that just to be different was their goal. They didn't want uh, Bitcoin miners to be used as Bitcoin spammers. <laughs> it's it's SHA-512 double. Um, no, it doesn't, uh, but it has to... The, the message time uh, has to be part of... The, the, there's a header. To, so there's a header and then the blob. And the header is where that uh, the, s the hash is, is, as well as the time. And the, it's the, the hash is the hash of the header and the body. So that the message, even if you wanted to, like if you were really going to spam the network, you would plan out in advance that I'm going to spam the network a month from now. So you'd set the time in the future to then build up tons of valid messages and then send them all out. But the CPU time to do that is still ridiculous. Um, the the protocol actually doesn't mandate uh, the that being the the hashing algorithm. So in theory, you could you could change it. Um, the other actual very, I'm glad you brought it up because I forgot about it. Um, so currently, the 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 minimum amount um, and and you were right uh, to get a message onto the network is is kind of like Bitcoin in that you are having so many zeros at the beginning. But the minimum is none. But you are allowed to, you yourself say, I only receive messages from people that have done up to 10. So you, your proof of work, your demand for proof of work can be higher. And that, bo both of those things are not so much set by the protocol, but by the clients. So if in the future, people sending um, messages with a proof of work level of one uh, are garbage all the time, if everybody just, you know, ups it or clients up it, it will they'll, those will stop being propagated through the network. Um, that's how that you get around that. Uh, like I said, proof of work is pretty intensive. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, so the, the header has the timestamp of when the computer that sent it claimed to have sent it. And so the next people that receive that, the first people that receive the message when it creates it onto the network, and everybody, because there's no way of knowing that the message was just created or not to anybody on the network, they check the timestamp, and they see if it's too far in the future or too far in the past. If it's valid at that point, they relay it across the network. What's to stop a bad actor from throwing away your messages? Nothing. The, the way you get around that is, so I'm currently connected to eight people. I'm relaying my message to eight people. And it, it'll, it'll get where it goes. Tell? You could. There would be no way to know that the message would have been lied about. If you wanted to turn in your homework late, you could do that. There would be nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, the only thing that would that would kind of work against that to some degree is you your um, database uh, for these messages here uh, in my inbox. I don't think it says. Oh no, it does. It tells you the date you received it as well. So I could know that it's unlikely that you sent a message to me and I've been on the network the whole time, and it was a day late. I mean that's possible, but unlikely that your message you know bounced around and never got to me. Um, so if your clock's wrong on your computer, uh, screwed. It's just like SSL. It, you're, and that's why it's two days. It's, it's a large window. Um, I think it's two days in the past and like eight hours in the future to deal with people that have funkiness like that. Yeah. Time zones. Uh, it, it's based on a GMT. Um, 
Oh. Oh no, I'm in the wrong place. You still haven't gotten it? It's ridiculous. It, yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's not currently. Um, the app is, is, is under rapid development. Um, there have been a lot of new features that have been added in lately. Uh, the big thing uh, to kind of fight against that that you could do is it has for Windows users and I guess uh, GNU Linux users too if they wanted, you can run in portable mode where you can tell it the keys are in a different spot than the default home dir. So you can keep your keys on a USB key. Um, and it also keeps the message, there's a keys database, a message database, and a messages seen database. So it could keep all three of those on your USB key. So you just keep that with you. It's gone. It, the, the way that your messages wouldn't be totally instantly poofed would be that if you use that, that uh, deterministic uh, password key. But your messages still would be gone. You just would continue to be able to get new messages on that ID. Any message you've marked um, that you would have act wouldn't be sent over again on the network. You, you might get lucky and see it again because it hasn't been deleted from the network yet. Because the only person that's aware that you act a message is the person that sent you the message. Because no one else knows that, that that's what happened. So they keep bouncing the messages for two days anyways. And Nathan is never going to get this message. Are you? How many messages have you processed since you turned on? 2,000? Yep. Any uh, questions? Any other questions? Uh, Bob? Right, exactly. Uh, currently, if you keep every message for that window, I think it's right around uh, the biggest it's ever gotten is 700 megabytes. And it was that when it was being attacked. Somebody was trying to spam the network. And so a lot of people were storing, you know, these garbage messages for two days. Um, obviously, that amount is going to go up. But it shouldn't go up so much because it, whenever it gets to an unmanageable level, they'll shard the network. Um, but it's good that it's big because it'll uh, be more for the NSA to dig. Okay, so uh, the way that works, um, or will work, um, is, is when you bootstrap your node, you will get locations of other shards that you don't care about and you can relay messages either to the people directly to you or to the shards. So the, the best, best practice would be to just relay your message into the network with the wrong shard, or I mean, with the shard where it's going to. And then those people would say, I didn't generate this message, it's safe for me to bounce out to the other shard. But you could, in theory, also just directly message it into the shard, um, the other, other shard, because they have no way of... Uh, you don't reveal who you are when you're sending. So there's nothing invalid about shard, someone from shard 1 sending a message to shard 2. It just looks like a message into shard 2. Um, um, currently, it's, it's just TCP traffic, uh, and it's just blobs. It doesn't seem to affect anybody yet. Hasn't been blocked anywhere yet. Uh, there's been some talks of people uh, wanting to route it over HTTP, like uh, obfuscated just for that reason, uh, but it hasn't been dealt with yet. Uh, I highly recommend everybody to uh, just run it through Tor because you should just run everything you can that doesn't matter through Tor. Through torrenting? No. I don't really care if you do that, but but, but don't do that. What are you talking about? I can torrent through Tor. The default, oh, right, it only allows port 80 and port 443, typically, but some people allow Tor out, I mean, torrent out of Tor. Right. But there are a lot of, like, if you go to Atlas, there are a lot of uh, Tor nodes that are just wide open. Have fun. Yeah. I don't know how many there are, I just... Got bored one day. There's a great website y'all should go to if you like Tor. Uh, yeah, that's Nathan right here. 
Oh, it didn't zoom in. <laughs> so, uh, so Tor Atlas is a really cool website. I wonder if there are any Tor nodes named ASDF. Yes, there are. So this just is a it show you uh, people that are running Tor exit or entry nodes or bridge nodes in the network, and it shows you how much traffic, huh? Right, bridges aren't, but every everything else um, is, is my understanding. Um, but yeah, it shows you how much traffic they route, how much freedom they're helping. Kind of unrelated. But never, never, never going to act my message. Jerk. So it's unknown. Message might never get better. You make me sad. Okay. Uh, So, um, no, 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 everybody, um, if it's been longer than two days, the message is going to be deleted from the network. And the default behavior of the client right now is to, uh, <laughs> I'll just copy and paste it. Uh, the default behavior of the client is to resend the message. Just redoes the work and sends it again. <laughs> it's base64, so the capitalization matters. But it's easy. So yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yep.